It's good to see everyone uh, this evening and uh, appreciate everyone being here to tonight, and uh, especially if you're visiting with us. We want to welcome you and I invite you to come back at any opportunity that you may have. And uh, we'd love to, to meet with you and uh, talk with you. If you're looking for a church home, uh, uh, we feel like this is the place you need to be. But uh, again, uh, those who are uh, watching uh, on the live stream, we welcome you also. And uh, certainly, uh, be, uh, the opportunity arises that we'd love to have you uh, be here present with us at uh, our, this congregation here. Those of you who are visiting, uh, my name is Keith Short. I'm one of the uh, elders and uh, be uh, serving as the moderator tonight for our discussion. And uh, as I mentioned, I certainly appreciate everyone being here. We're definitely looking forward to a great discussion from our panel. And uh, first of all, let me introduce our panel. Uh, some of you know these, uh, these men, but uh, let me introduce uh, these uh, three gentlemen here. Uh, to, my, uh, to your left on the end uh, is Keith Pickard. Uh, he's the uh, pulpit minister at, uh, for Bethel Church of Christ in Dunlap. Uh, before that, he was the pulpit minister at uh, Highland Heights Church in Lebanon. Uh, Tennessee, and also the associate minister in the Laverne uh, Church of Christ. Uh, Keith holds a Master of Divinity uh, degree from Heritage Christian University and has uh, extensive experience in youth, family, and pulpit ministry. Uh, Keith is married to Anna, and together they have two children, Titus and Allison. And welcome to you tonight, uh, yes, sir. Keith. You. A great name for an individual. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Uh, seated next uh, to me here is uh, Nathan Foster. Uh, Nathan is, serves as the pulpit minister uh, for the Troy Church of Christ in Troy, Tennessee. And of course, prior to this, uh, Nathan served as the youth minister for the West Main Church of Christ in Tupelo, Mississippi, and the Shady Acres Church of Christ in Sykeston, Missouri. Uh, Nathan is a graduate of Fried Hardeman and has worked in many different areas, uh, including real estate, uh, athletics and uh, education. Uh, he's the creator of Content Warning Podcast and serves on the board for, for the New Pathways Children Home, Children's Home. And Nathan is married to Chelsea, and together they have two boys, Riley and Rhett. And uh, Nathan, welcome. Thank you. Enjoy. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Uh, the gentleman in the middle, most of you know. Uh, uh, Brother Joshua Houston uh, serves as our pulpit minister uh, here at Salem Creek Church. And uh, Joshua holds a, a bachelor's degree in Bible, a master's degree in New Testament from Fried Hardeman, a master of philosophy, and just recently, and we're certainly proud of him for that, a uh, PhD in biblical, biblical studies from Faulkner University. Uh, Joshua has written two books about Christian living and of course speaks regularly at churches and lectureships on uh, various topics. Joshua was married to Kayla, who's also active in uh, teaching the young ladies here at Salem Creek. Our panel tonight will be asked a question specifically directed at them. And of course after they answer that question, uh, the other panelists uh, uh, are able to contribute uh, to an answer to that particular question. Uh, the questions, and we certainly appreciate the questions that we have tonight, uh, come from our uh, young people uh, here at uh, Salem Creek. And we certainly appreciate uh, their coming up with these questions. Uh, some of these questions uh, you may uh, want to know the answer to as well as adults. And we'll start uh, tonight with our question with uh, Brother Joshua. And uh, the question is, is Satan suffering for leaving the Lord, or does he just enjoy having his own place, and is he punished? There's a lot of, a lot of questions there. I think there's about three questions in that one question. So to answer the first, to ask, you, is Satan suffering? There is suffering in leaving the Lord. That's true for all of us. You read in Genesis 3 of the first divine rebellion that took place 
with the serpent figure. In Genesis 3, the serpent is never called Satan. He's never called the devil. He's just called the serpent. And uh, you see the, the kernel of the Old Testament popped in the New Testament in the book of Revelation where that serpent figure is called the devil and Satan. And we get a little more insight into that. But yes, we, are, we all suffer if we leave the Lord. And the ultimate suffering for leaving the Lord is hell. And I think that is what this question presupposes. But it's not exactly what the Bible has to say about the current state of the devil. So, you know, you turn the TV on around Halloween time and you see cartoons and TV shows about how the devil is sitting on the throne in hell with fire and the demons all around. And the, the Bible doesn't give us that picture of the devil. Instead, what the Bible does is it says that the devil is alive and well here, present on the earth. You see that in Genesis 3 with the fall. The curse that comes to the serpent is that on your belly you will go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And there, uh, that's probably a reference to uh, having something to do with death in the underworld. But then in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul talks about how Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And in the ancient world, they viewed all the gods and all the demons and kind of the up there in the, in the air and in the clouds. And then uh, you also have in Revelation chapter 20, verses 7 through 15, the ultimate reality of what's going to happen to the devil. And we read in Revelation 20 that there is a great pit. It's a bottomless pit. It's a, a lake of fire. And that three entities are going to be thrown in that lake of fire. Death and Hades, Satan, and the followers of Satan, those who are the unrighteous who have not... Uh, engaged in that covenant relationship with Jesus. And so those, those three, most people look at that as being very scary and being a bad thing. I think if you're in Christ, you should look at that as a really good thing because death will be no more, sin will be no more, and uh, those who follow after that. What, what hell is, is it's the ultimate reality of what sinful people want, which is a life without God. And if you really want to see what a life without God looks like, look at hell. That's what it is. So the, the question about Satan, um, is he, does he enjoy having his own place? Well, he hasn't yet been thrown into that pit. He's still, God allows Satan a long leash. And the question for why is another question for another time. And I'll just give you my answer really quick. I don't know. Um, but God has given Satan a long leash. And our job is to combat him. And uh, he doesn't have that place yet. Is he being punished? Well, we all are uh, if we live a life separate from God. Yeah. Um, I like what you said, Joshua, about, um, I think you alluded to how um, Satan's inevitable de demise is intended to give us hope as Christians. Um, it, it makes me think of Revelation, read it, Revelation chapter 12, uh, verse 12, uh, that, that talked about the child and the, and the dragon there. Um, in verse 12 it says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you dwell in them, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So the, it's only a matter of time until the devil meets his inevitable demise. And, and that, that, gives us, that gives us hope, that gives us reassurance of... Um, you know, this living in this present existence where it's possible to be tempted by the devil who roams around like a roaring lion <clears throat> seeking those whom he may devour. Um, it gives me hope to know that I am going to live. If, I, if I'm a Christian, if I'm walking in, uh, in the spirit, if I'm uh, walking in the light as he is in the light and, and am faithful to the Lord... I'm going to live in an existence and a reality in which, the ten, in, in, in which Satan is not going to be a threat anymore. Uh, Satan, the world, the flesh, uh, the, the, our, our, our greatest enemies uh, will be vanquished, uh, ultimately. Uh, will, will be no more. Uh, so looking at Satan's suffering <laughs> for eternity, I guess, uh, is, a, is a hopeful thing for us. I would. The only thing I would add is, is I think that this question, uh, in particular, really speaks to the reality 
um, that the majority of what we base our views of the afterlife on really come from things like something along the lines of Dante's Inferno or the Divine Comedy uh, or pop culture. Uh, and I don't mean that with any disrespect to whoever asked the question, uh, but it's, I think it's important for us, as you guys kind of pointed out, to, to, you know, from a biblical perspective, look for Bible answers. Mm -hmm. um, because you don't see, like, the, the pop culture view that we have of, of Satan, where he's just kind of chilling with his own realm to rule over and is seeking to just have his cohorts, you know, brought to him is not necessarily the, the most biblically accurate depiction of, of what that is. And so I think that's an important thing to, to kind of point out uh, that, uh, you know, we, we've got to be sure that we look for, for Bible answers to Bible questions, which is, you know, what we're doing tonight. And I appreciate that. So, Okay. All right. Uh, Brother Nathan, uh, the next question, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, the question is, can you go further into dating as a Christian? Because I feel it isn't talked about enough. Yeah. Um, I told Joshua he was going to get himself in trouble um, giving the most open-ended question to the guy who arguably talks the most uh, on this panel. But uh, you're right. Whoever asked it, they're 100% they're right. Um, this is not something that is talked about enough uh, within the church. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Mainly, uh, that this topic is something that uh, I believe the church is relegated to be the sole responsibility of parents mm -hmm. uh, to teach their children how to engage in, in dating. Um, and I don't completely disagree with that. Uh, when it comes to how we date, when it comes to how we treat uh, a significant other that we hope to one day be our spouse, um, I think that, that there is a massive responsibility of parents to teach that to their children uh, in, in not just a, an academic point of view, but in living out out that particular uh, way of life. However, I do think that there is room for the church to play a role uh, in helping our, our teens and our young people engage in uh, what I'll call healthy relationship building. Um, and, and kind of uh, when they're first venturing into that, that dating realm, especially with those who may not have uh, either the greatest home life or the best example to follow when it comes to how to engage in, in healthy Christian dating. Um, so second, that, that's part of it. Secondly, I think that there's something that this is something rather that's not talked about enough because the Bible really doesn't address it. Um, when you think about the way that we date uh, in a modern society, the Bible doesn't really address it. It has a lot to say about marriage. Uh, it has a lot to say about the kind of love that spouses are to have for one another. It has a lot to say about the type of people that we surround ourselves with. But dating in the modern sense didn't exist at the time that the Bible was written. Uh, and without getting like, bogged down in too much of a history lesson, um, this idea of, of courtship really didn't gain popularity until about the 1920s. And then casual dating, as we kind of uh, see it, wasn't really a widespread concept until the 1980s. And so the, the idea of dating, uh, at least the way we use it in a modern sense, really in the scheme of things is, is a, a new topic. Um, and so, but, but that being said, I think that it is something that needs to be taken seriously by, by Christians. And so uh, without taking up too much time from, from these guys, I would give uh, really three main pieces of advice for, for Christians who are about to engage in, in that dating uh, arena, I guess is what I would say. Um, so for, firstly, I would say don't downplay the significance of dating. Um, when, when you date somebody, you're becoming a part or, or a chapter in that person's life, for better or for worse. Uh, and they're all, I think all of us would agree, those of us that have dated for a while and, and are married would agree that there are relationships that we either want a do-over or uh, feel as though we might have wasted some sort of time or, uh, you know, that, that relationship made us who we are today, but we definitely wouldn't want to relive that relationship. And so there is, a, there, there is an impact in somebody's life as well as somebody's family uh, that you have when you agree to date somebody. Uh, and so I think that, that that's a significance that doesn't need to be downplayed, uh, that there is a, there is a, there a very high chance that uh, you're going to date somebody who may never think of you ever again once that relationship ends. But there's also a chance that you're going to be somebody's first of any number of things. Uh, and the same is true for you on the receiving end, that when you date, you are allowing somebody to, to come into your life, to come into your heart, uh, and to some level or another, you are committed to them. Uh, and the way you treat others and allow yourself to be treated plays a role in every relationship you will have from that point on. And, and I don't want that to sound overly dramatic, but I think we've created a culture where um, more and more and more we, we see uh, from working with teens for a pretty good amount of time, um, we, we throw around that, well, I'm, I'm just dating. 
uh, you know, we're just talking. Like, we're talking, but we're not talking, talking, right? Uh, you know, if you say a word second, like, after another, it creates the, the change. Uh, there, there's something that changes the meaning of it. Uh, and so there's, there's that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I would get asked as a youth minister, um, you know, what's the big deal about sexual intimacy? It's just sex. Uh, and so we've created this overly casual atmosphere around dating and around physical intimacy, but it's not just anything. Uh, it's a much bigger deal than that. Um, and, and I think that the way we treat people, uh, we should treat it with importance. And, and I think that the, the more we engage in that in a healthy way, the more that we understand the impact of it, the, the better positioned we'll be to find healthier and more meaningful relationships. Um, the other thing I would say is, is don't rush into dating. Um, not dating a lot is okay. Um, there is a temptation to want to be with somebody for a number of reasons, and maybe the, number the, maybe the number one reason is because society has taught us or conditioned us or told us that we're supposed to be with somebody. We're supposed to be dating. We're supposed to go out and, and date a bunch of people and figure out what we like. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a great chapter to read, period. Uh, it's a really fantastic uh, portion of the epistle that, that Paul writes there. But 1 Corinthians 7 is a really great chapter to read if you are single uh, because he calls singleness uh, a blessing in a lot of ways. Uh, and we might not want to hear this tonight, but i got to be honest, the church, I think, is the worst in convincing our young people that they need to be dating. Um, I, I, I grew up as, as, a, as a person that was did not sound harsh, but the victim of that, right? Like I had uh, at least four different old ladies that wanted to matchmake me with all of their granddaughters. Uh, not like they really were scraping the bottom of the barrel when it came to who they were trying to set their granddaughters up with. But that was the reality of the church culture that I grew up in. We wanted to matchmake everybody. We wanted to, you know, if we saw a single person, we go, oh, what's wrong with them? We should fix them up with so-and-so because they're both single. And, and in a lot of ways, we've kind of, as the church, we've kind of demeaned what singleness is. Uh, we've kind of demeaned in a lot of ways the importance that single people play uh, in the role of, uh, of the kingdom. Um, the church loves to play matchmaker, and we don't realize that there's a potential harm that comes from this message or this mindset that married people mean more to the kingdom and have more to offer to the kingdom than those who are single. Uh, and I've ministered to people who are in incredibly unhealthy marriages because that's the way they thought, that's the only way they thought they could be in a quote unquote good standing within the church, within the kingdom is to be married. Um, and, and I think that we need to be really careful about that. Uh, and then the, the last thing, maybe the most important thing I would say about engaging in dating is to understand what your intentions are before you start. Um, Joshua, you and I did a podcast kind of on this particular topic recently, and we discussed that the modern day concept of dating in a way is a lot like practicing for divorce um, in the sense that we engage in a relationship, we do it for a little while, and then when we get bored or we get unhappy, we go, eh, let's just break up and move on to the next person. And that's, what kind of, that, that's part of what dating is for. But if you do that over and over and over and over, you're conditioning yourself to believe in that. Then when you get married... There's, there's a sense of commitment that there's a temptation to kind of falter in that, that you don't see that as, as, uh, as big of a deal. Uh, but when you, you casually date, you're saying you're committed to a person, but then you, you cut it off. Uh, and I know this might go without saying, but there's a 99.99% chance uh, that uh, the, one of the people you end up dating is who you're going to end up marrying. Um, I know that the price of beef is getting ridiculous right now, and so I'm leaving that like 0.01 chance that there's still an arranged marriage maybe here uh, at some point. But... Um, th there's there's a, a, a chance uh, of that happening, um, or there's a, there's a high likelihood that the person you marry is going to be somebody that you, you dated. And so uh, to figure out what your intentions are up front is a big deal. Um, are you dating somebody because you just want companionship? Uh, are you dating somebody because all of your friends have girlfriends or boyfriends and you feel kind of left out, so you feel like you need to, to date somebody? Are you dating somebody because you're bored? Uh, are you dating somebody because there's some sort of physical satisfaction that you're trying to get them to meet? Or are you dating with the desire and intention of saying, you know, I want to find a spouse and build a family. And, and once you get to that point, you can start looking for those, those people who share your faith and your principles and your priorities and uh, maybe have the same outlook and goals in their life as, as you do. Uh, and I, I tell people all the time that this is a really tricky concept to figure out what that intention is up front because uh, nobody lies to you like you lie to you. Um, that There's just a concept that nobody, nobody lies to me the way that I, I lie to me. And so um, having a really honest conversation with ourselves about why I'm engaging in dating in the first place 
uh, I think is, is really uh, above all really of, of great significance. Uh, and so I would say above all, pray about it and be patient. Uh, and in the meantime, do what you can to, to glorify God. Uh, and again, I could keep going on and on, but I'll, I'll, I'll cut myself off. So. Either one. Keith. Um, one of the things personally that I think is uh, very important when it comes to Christians dating that I, I, I personally think uh, the church needs to, uh, we, need, we need to do a better job at, at teaching our young people this, uh, the importance of dating and marrying a Christian. Um, you know, we look at the Bible's teaching on marriage. Uh, it's marriage is two, one man and one woman who are on mission together. Uh, they're, they're, on, they're, on, they're on a mission to help one another be faithful uh, to, to Christ. They're, they're, they're on a mission to uh, raise kids together that are reflections of Jesus. Uh, they're, they're two people that are, are on mission together to reach the lost for this world. They're, they're, they're two people that are on mission together to reflect Christ and the church. As Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul, Paul says, um, he quotes Genesis chapter 2, uh, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he says, uh, I'm saying that this, is, this refers to Christ and the church. This is about Christ and the church. This is an illustration of Christ and the church. Uh, so one of the main meanings of, of, Christ, of, of marriage from a Christian worldview, uh, from a Christian perspective, uh, is that it is, a, it is intended to be a reflection of the gospel, uh, a reflection of how Jesus has treated his church, uh, a reflection of Jesus' covenant with his church. And, you know, I think it's important, maybe a healthy question to ask to someone who's thinking about dating, thinking about a person that they're going to date and a person that they're going to marry. You know, a question to ask yourself is, you know, when you, when you date this person, you know, you date in, in order to potentially marry that, that person. Uh, it's a good question to ask, you know, how can you effectively live on mission with a person who doesn't share your faith. Um, so so I, I personally, I, I think that's extremely important uh, when, we're, when we're talking about dating, Christian dating. Um, aspire to marry a Christian because it's very important. Okay. The, on, the only thing that I would add to that is uh, I'm probably the least qualified to speak to this but in a way I'm also one of the most qualified to speak to this because I don't have children and I don't have children who are dating but the one thing that I do want to say is to the parents because all of us up here all of us in this room at one point have been that teenager who was dating and we know what it's like to go to someone's house particularly as a guy you go to that girl's house and you meet her father for the first time. And if you're a young man who's worth your salt, you're respectful and also a little fearful. Um, and that's, that's a good thing. But the advice that I want to give is to the parents. Welcome that person in. You know, wel don't, don't, don't welcome in someone who's detrimental. You know in wisdom who is a good person and who's not. But welcome them in because you never know the impact that you might have on that person. And I know, like, I have a cousin now who has a daughter who is getting into the dating scene. And she asked on Facebook, okay, friends, what do I need to do for, for my daughter as she's starting to date? And everyone was like, make sure she's home by 730. <laughs> Children are a temporary assignment from the Lord. You have 18 years to train up that child in the way that he or she should go. And if you've done a good job, then you should feel comfortable letting that child go and, and letting that child understand sometimes you have to fall, sometimes you have to make mistakes, and, and you as a parent can be there to pick them up and, 
and dust them off and, and offer forgiveness and grace where that's needed. But as a parent, be someone who is willing to open your arms, open your heart, open your home to someone else because that person may wind up one day being part of your home and your house. And, and I think that's a, an important thing to remember. Okay, excellent thoughts. Uh, Brother Keith, this was a question for you. If the world started with Adam and Eve, how do we have different races and ethnic groups? Uh, yeah, that, that's a really good question. Um, how many of you like people watching? <laughs> no one? Yeah. I do. <laughs> uh, call me weird, but I think it's fun to just go to Walmart and just sit on a bench and just watch all the people. Uh, you see all kinds of stuff. Uh, people of all different shapes and sizes and, uh, and, and colors, to, to use the old labels, red, yellow, black, and white. I mean, especially here in a culturally diverse place like Murfreesboro, you step in a Walmart, you see, you see all kinds of people uh, with, with different backgrounds, with different facial complexions and uh, skin colors and, 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 and things like that. Uh, so I guess the question is, you know, where, where, where does all of that come from? If, if the world started with Adam and Eve, how do we have, if the world started with, started with just two people, then how in the world do we have all of these different kinds of people? Um, the basic answer, I'm, I'm not going to be too long with this. Uh, you, can, you can look s several articles that are more scientific-based. I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to pretend to be one or anything. Uh, but the, the basic biblical response uh, to this question, and not only the biblical response, but also the scientific response, is that there is only one race, and that is the human race. Yeah. There's only one race, the human race. That's what the Bible says. Um, look at Acts chapter 17, um, verse 26. It says, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Uh, so that's what, that's, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says that um, red, yellow, black, and white, whatever uh, ethnicity, background, race that a person comes from, the, the, the skin tone that they have, the facial complexion, all originated with one family. Um, and that's scientifically true as well. You look at a modern day scientist um, and they'll, e e even those who don't, even scientists that don't have a Christian worldview will say that. They'll, they'll agree on the fact that if you, if you take any, any two people, say one person from America and the, uh, another person from Timbuktu, <laughs> or where, wherever that is. Um, and, you, and if you look at their genetic makeup, uh, what sets them apart as different is extremely minute. Um, it's, it, it's extremely small. Uh, they're, they're, the, the genetic material within human beings of all different kinds and shapes and colors is... Uh, very, very, very similar. Um, so, uh, and, and some, some people, even um, evolutionary theorists will, will say that um, the term races, different races, um, should be dropped altogether because it's not even helpful. Uh, it's not even a useful term that uh, reflects accurate information. There's, there's only one race, scientifically and biblically, um, and that's the human race. And, and that, that tells us that um, from a biblical perspective, there's, with, that, with that being said, there's no justification whatsoever for racism uh, to see one kind of person as inferior um, to another kind of, of person that is more superior. Um, that's actually more akin to Darwinian evolution <laughs> right. uh, than it is 
uh, Christianity. Um, the, the beauty of the gospel, uh, the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that both Jew and Gentile, uh, both um, black and white, uh, red, yellow, black and white, have become one new man, have become one creation. And that's, you know, that's what we uphold as, 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 as Christians. Um, we, we are a people that, that believe that it doesn't matter what you look like, where you came from, where, where your, uh, what, what, your, what your skin color is. We are all of one family uh, in Jesus, biologically, and if we're in Jesus, spiritually. Uh, so I guess that's how I'd answer that. <laughs> uh, I would just add a little more in the weeds of the scientific thing. You get it in Scripture. Um, scholars have estimated that if Adam and Eve had a pretty narrow genetic code as God created them, and then, of course, Eve is made from the, the side or the rib, some translations say, of Adam. And, you know, we don't know what their genetic code was, but assuming that it was relatively narrow, if Adam and Eve had ten kids, they would have the entire genetic makeup in those ten children to make every single ethnic group on planet Earth today. And so what we see is that they have three sons, Cain, Abel, and Seth. But they, we also see in uh, Genesis 5 and verse 5 in those pesky little genealogies that no one reads, it says, uh, or excuse me, in verse 6, it says, during this time he had, or verse 4, golly, I'll get it right in a minute. It says, during this time he had other sons and daughters. My point there is that there are more than Cain, Abel, and Seth. And we don't know how many more, but if there were 10, you have the entire genetic code, and then you flip the page over a few to uh, Genesis chapter 10. After the flood, you have Noah and his sons, and we do not know what the genetic makeup was of Noah and his wife or of his sons and their wives, but what we know is that it is diverse enough. I think it's about 1,500 years between Adam and Noah. So you have enough genetic code at that point that in Genesis chapter 10, when the dispersion of the nations come, uh, of course, that's going to take place after the Tower of Babel, even though it comes before the Tower of Babel in, in Scripture. It's not chronological. So you have that dispersion where each group goes their own way. So it's right here in Scripture about how you get it. There's a lot more to be said, especially with the Table of Nations, but uh, I need to hush and let Nathan talk for a minute. Oh, no, I, like I said, I don't know that I can add anything other than what you guys have already said. Um, I will say uh, that there are several different theories about this, right? Um, that there's, there's all sorts of scholarly material that you can read, uh, places like Apology Express, Answers in Genesis. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who have dedicated their entire lives to uh, trying to answer questions like this. My only suggestion, uh, not that these are, are bad questions, right? These are really fun questions to answer. They're interesting questions to struggle with. Uh, my, my concern... Uh, what my advice would be to people is is uh, don't get overly bogged down in questions like this because uh, they're interesting but when it comes to our responsibility as Christians when it comes to the gospel message uh, there are in my opinion more important things to worry about than than things like this not that these things are not fantastic to wrestle with and like I said you can do all sorts of reading through through all sorts of different sources and and get uh, different opinions and, and essence like that but uh, I would say if we spend more of our time wrestling with stuff like this as opposed to things that might be more uh, prominent in our lives we could do ourselves a bit of a disservice um, not that it's a bad question by any stretch but uh, but yeah it's very interesting for sure all right, very good uh, Brother Keith, we'll go, come back to you again. Is there marriage in heaven? Um, yeah, and I, I think Jesus answers this. Uh, I'll just I'll read it, and if you want to turn with me to Matthew chapter twenty-two, uh, verses twenty-three through thirty-three. Uh, Matthew 22, 23 through, uh, through 33. In, in this portion of Scripture, the Sadducees come to, to Jesus and they, they ask him a question. And um, Their question's not sincere. Uh, they're trying to, they're being rascals trying to trip him up uh, because they don't even believe in the resurrection. They're trying to, to make him look silly. Uh, but this is, this is what they say. The same, the same day, Sadducees came to him who say that there's no resurrection. 
And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies, having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring left with his wife to his brother. So too the second and third down to the seventh. And after them all the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. I mean, it's, and Jesus... Uh, <laughs> I love what Jesus said. He, just, he says, you're wrong. <laughs> Guys, you're, he, he says in verse 29, But Jesus answered them, You are wrong, because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Now, just to basically answer the question, the way I read this, um, what Jesus is alluding to um, is uh, I, don't, I don't think that there will be the institution of, of marriage as we see it within our present day in the resurrection uh, in, in heaven. I, I think Jesus a, a, alludes to that. Um, and, and that might be a, a question that um, maybe, a, I guess these are teenagers that are, that are asking this, and someone might be thinking, well, am I not even going to have a, what if Jesus comes back, and I'm, am, I, am I not even going to have an opportunity to, to be married, you know? Um, but uh, I think we need to we keep in mind uh, whatever heaven looks like, whatever the experience uh, that we will have, the experience of the, of the full presence of God, being in the full presence of God in a right relationship with Him, trumps anything else. <laughs> Heaven, whatever it is, whatever, whatever it's, it's going to be like, it's going to be a thousand million billion times better than the experience you have in this present reality. Um, and that's something that you can, um, you can have hope in. Uh, and just to, as, a, as a side note, uh, as we're, since we're talking about these things, I think it's, it's related. I, I, do think that we'll, I do think we will know each other in heaven. I think that's a, a question a lot of people have. Um, scripture seems to paint the picture of people's identities on earth being their identities also in heaven. Um, you look at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus and then Luke 16. Um, Lazarus' identity on earth is his identity in the afterlife. Um, uh, Moses and Elijah that meets Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Um, that's their identity even after they, they, they had died. Um, so, you know... it. And thinking about those that maybe you're married to someone, your spouse now, um, in, in this present existence, um, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I've never, I've never been there. Um, it, it may be that you have a, um, a, 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 a special kind of relationship with your spouse in heaven, possibly. Um, that, that very well uh, could be. Um, but I think that Jesus is alluding to the fact that the institution of marriage as we see it in our present existence will be no more. So, I guess. Yeah, the, I agree with you, and in sort of a tongue-in-cheek way, there is marriage in heaven, but it's the marriage of Jesus and the church. Uh, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb that you read about in Revelation chapter 19. Um, Revelation 19 and verse 7. Let us rejoice and exult and give Him glory because the wedding celebration of the Lamb has come and His bride has made herself ready. That's talking about the church being ordained for Jesus. And so I think the point that Jesus is trying to get across to the Sadducees in Matthew 22 is, you know, because they're right. Uh, Leveret marriage says if your husband dies, then the bride should marry one of the brothers and have offspring so that her lineage could be carried on, she could be cared for. 
And so they're right about that, but all of them die, and their question is, well, who's she going to belong to in the resurrection? Jesus says, you're, you're not thinking about heavenly things. And I think that's, that's his point. So we need to be more concerned about the marriage supper of the Lamb as far as uh, the resurrection goes. I agree. I, I, I don't know what else. Yeah, I don't really know what else to, to, to add to that. Uh, I do think with, uh, with Matthew 22, I do think that that, that context is important. Um, I, I, I agree. I don't know that the institution... Uh, of marriage is going to be something there, but I, I do agree that uh, we will, I, I believe personally, that we'll recognize uh, each other yeah. um, in, in that particular realm. But I do think that there is a, there is a context to take into account where, um, you know, the question being presented here is one of those uh, questions that Jesus gets asked a lot where it's, uh, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trick him this time and we're going to figure out exactly where he's, where he's falling on this, uh, which is key to your point why I think it's Kind of hysterical how he answers their particular question, uh, but yeah, I, I I agree with with what you uh, both said. Okay, uh, brother Nathan, we'll come back to you. Uh, what would you tell someone who is struggling with pornography, and what can they do to stop? Uh, so much, I would say. Um, now, I, I, I'm. To put all this up front, I don't want to muddy the waters surrounding this particular topic because I don't think that there, there's any way that you can argue that this is a morally appropriate thing to do. So I want everybody to be sure that I, I, you understand that I say that, that pornography is not a morally acceptable thing to do at all. However, I do believe that the church has made this something that is so taboo uh, that we think that somehow it is one of the worst possible sins that you can indulge in. Um, and I don't believe that's the case. Uh, I believe that if you have a, a major porn problem and you have a major gossip problem, you are in the same state spiritually. Uh, and and I, I think that there's uh, something that, uh, that we've done as, as, co as a culture and as a church that we've just placed more shame on one of those than the other. Um, and now, I'm not saying that the, the length of consequences is the same with both of those things. However, uh, I, I do think that, uh, that, that there is something to be said about um, the spiritual state of those who have a problem with porn or a problem with lying or a problem with gossip or a problem with lust or whatever the case may be, uh, that we do our best not to rank those in order from best to worst. Uh, but as far as saying things to, to encourage people, what would I say to somebody um, that... Uh, and, and, I want to say I'm lucky, but it's not that I'm lucky. I've just I've been in this situation before, uh, and so one of the first things that, that I want to tell somebody uh, is that is that I love you, uh, and that I don't think anything less of you. Uh, and I think that that's so significant within the church to make sure that people understand that yes, what you're doing is wrong. Now, to backtrack for just if somebody is coming to me and telling me, hey, I've got a problem with porn, they understand that it's wrong. Um, it's the people that won't mention it that, that believe that there's not a problem with it. But to say that, that I love you uh, and that I don't think anything less of you, that I understand this is a struggle that you have, uh, we need to understand and respect the fact that if somebody is coming to you, if somebody is coming to us and saying, hey, I have a problem with porn, can you help or, or what should I do, uh, that that is probably one of, if not the most difficult thing for them to do. Um, as, as somebody who's lived it, as somebody who's ministered to it, um, that is one of, if not the most difficult thing for somebody to do. Anybody who's struggled with any sort of habitual sin understands that one of the hardest things to do is to say it out loud to somebody else. Um, and so to be able to see them for who they truly are um, as, a, as a soul that is created in the image of God, that is struggling and is seeking to correct that behavior uh, is more important than I can really put into words. Uh, for somebody to know that you care about them, that you're not going to condemn them, that you're not going to start a crusade to kick them out of the church, that you're, you, you genuinely care about and are offering a heartfelt and sincere, I love you, how can we figure this out together, um, may very well be the thing that keeps them out of that temptation in the future. Um, to, when so, if somebody were to come to you and say something like that, for you to beat them down and to say, well, man, that's awful. How could you ever do something like this? You've got a wife and kids, and you really ought to just be absolutely ashamed of yourself. Chances are you may be the last person they ever talk to about that. Um, and that's, that's a cycle that the church viciously needs to break. Um, and so I would, I would say that I love you uh, and that I don't think anything less of you. I would also say that this isn't hopeless. Um, this is a problem within the church, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. I don't want to get overly bogged down with statistics, but generally speaking, uh, according to the Barna Group, within the church as a whole, 50% uh, of men and 30% of women, this is something that they struggle with at some point in their life. Um, within the church, 56% of divorces that involve Christians, uh, the couples say that pornography played a significant factor in 
their decision to get a divorce. Um, I think it's somewhere in the 45% is the primary reason that somebody gets a divorce within the church. These are within the church statistics. This isn't like the broad scheme of humanity as a whole. This is within the church statistics. Uh, and so to understand that this isn't a hopeless problem, to understand that this isn't even, in a lot of instances, a unique problem that you are struggling with by yourself uh, is, is a major, major thing. Uh, and I say that to let people know that this is not as uncommon as a lot of times the church would have us believe. Um, that this is something that uh, I, could, I could count to you probably the number uh, of, of close friends that I had from the time I was 16 years old to the time I was, I mean, even now, I could probably count to you the number, uh, the number on, on maybe two fingers, how many close friends I had that had not struggled with this at some point in their life. Uh, and, and the number of people who have overcome that and are still working to overcome that uh, is a high percentage as well. And so to reiterate to somebody that there is absolutely still hope for somebody who struggles with this, uh, I think is a big part of the factor as well. Um, and, and to look to the right sources of hope, um, that you undoubtedly have the ability to repent and take steps to overcome sin, uh, whether it's struggling with pornography or something else. Uh, and so that, that, I, I think that's a, a big thing to reiterate. Uh, and then I'm, I'm also a guy who believes in... Um, being as, as, as realistic with people as possible. Um, I, I used to say all the time that I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist, right? Which just means that you're a pessimistic, you just don't want to admit it. Um, but uh, I, I tell people it's not easy. Um, it's not an easy thing. Overcoming sin, period, is not an easy thing. And I wholeheartedly believe that. But I also wholeheartedly believe that the more honest you are with people, and the more honest that you are with yourself, the better prepared you will be in order to overcome the sin that's in your life, porn or otherwise. Um, and then what I would say as far as uh, what can you do to stop, um, because this is, and if, if you don't hear anything else I've said tonight, I want you to understand this. If you are struggling with this and you're looking for advice on how to overcome it, um, you have to find accountability. You cannot in any way, form, or fashion, um, and, and inevitably somebody will come and say, well, I did it on my own, and that's great for you, but... With what the nature of porn is and how widespread it has become and the damage it can cause, there is no way, in my opinion, in the 21st century, you can overcome a sin like this by yourself. You just can't do it. Uh, it is too readily available. It is too toxic. It is, it is too easy to hide nowadays. Um, as a youth minister, these were things that we heard all the time, and there became a, a problem where, uh, for, for parents that are looking for resources on this, there's a, a website, the C, CYPU, I think it is, um, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. There is a, I read an article one time about how there was a new app out called Calculator Plus. Uh, if any of you have heard, not to give people an excuse to go looking for ways to do this, but Calculator Plus was a calculator app. It operated exactly like a calculator. But if you put in a particular math problem, it became a secret vault within your phone that you could hide images or text messages. Uh, and so I say all that to say that you have to be able to find accountability. There is, you have to have somebody, whether it's a spouse, a close friend, and, and I would encourage people, find more than one somebody. Um, finding six or seven or eight or nine is phenomenal. Um, but you have to be able to tell somebody about it, to trust somebody, to hold you accountable, to walk through that with you. Um, I tell people to say it out loud. Uh, the church has a really bad problem of saying, God, please forgive, me of our, please forgive me of my sins. And our private prayer will say, please forgive me of my sins. Uh, say your sins out loud. You'll be shocked at how like, almost painful that is at times, uh, but, but how freeing that can be. Uh, so say it out loud and allow somebody to work with you to hold you accountable. Um, and understand, it's, it's going to be potentially embarrassing. It's going to be awkward. Uh, depending on the situation of life that you're in, people are going to be hurt by it. Uh, you know, people, and, and you talk about, this is, uh, again, I forget the exact number, but it's somewhere in the 50 plus percent of, uh, of church uh, pastors or, or ministers struggle with this. And you're talking about guys that are married with children who are preaching every Sunday who struggle with this particular sin. Uh, and so to, to say it out loud, to understand that it's going to be awkward, it's going to be painful. However, to ignore the awkwardness and the pain is only going to cause a greater devastation in the long term. Um, and I'm not talking about 20 years down the road getting caught finally. I'm talking about in the spiritual, in the eternal. 
that you can pretend for 60 plus years if you want that you don't have a problem with this, but if you've ignored it for that long and you've lived a life separated from God because this is what you're allowing to happen in your life, porn or otherwise, um, you're going to end up on the wrong side of judgment. Uh, and so find somebody who can help lovingly hold you accountable throughout this process. Uh, and again, I could go on and on and on and say more, but I won't take up any more time from anything you guys have to say. So. Well, let me, let me pause for just a minute and say, I know that we are over our normal worship time. Thank you all for being with us tonight. I appreciate that. I see everybody checking watches and phones. It's not going to hurt any of our feelings if anyone needs to leave for sake of needing to do that. Just want you to know. But these two guys drove three hours to be here with us tonight. And so I appreciate sincerely your time and attention. And we don't want to abuse that. I just want you to know we're not going to be offended if you have things because, you know, our time has run out. But we're going to continue to answer these questions because they're worth answering. So to the question, um, sin is fighting for real estate in your mind. Everyone has certain, uh, an amount of brain width that everything in the world, be it righteous or unrighteous, is fighting for. And so my advice for uh, how do you handle not only that problem but any problem is practice the spiritual disciplines. If you don't know what the spiritual disciplines are, uh, they are things that you can do on a daily or weekly basis that will help you come closer to God. Things like prayer, Bible study, um, something as simple as celebration, um, something as complex as fasting. And the, the fact of the matter is, if I tell you right now to think of a red dog, you're going to think of a red dog. And if I tell you to stop thinking about a red dog, you can't do it. But if I tell you to think about a yellow elephant, you'll quit thinking about a red dog because now something else has taken that real estate in your mind. That's what the spiritual disciplines do. They let us have freed up real estate in our mind to focus on God. Yeah. Um, Personally, I, I think what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 29 and 30, is, is very, very helpful. Not, not just to beat us over the head with, but, but to give us a helpful principle as, as we attempt to, to fight this uh, pervasive sin that has uh, plagued our society and even church. I'm sure both of these guys have counseled Many, many people who have, um, who, who, have, who have got caught into this. But, but Jesus says in verse 29, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, the principle there when Jesus is talking about lust, is do whatever it takes to remove the temptation from your midst. Uh, and I th per personally, um, I, I think applying this principle to this problem would be to get rid of whatever device you use to access the material. If it's your phone, Get a, a Scotty beam me up flip phone. You know, <laughs> they still make those <laughs> where you, you can't access the internet or anything. Um, get rid of your, your personal computer um, and find uh, if, if you uh, get, you know, get your iPad, your, your Xbox, uh, whatever you use to access the material get rid of it because it's not worth you keeping that and then continue to give yourself to a sin that some people have said is as powerful as heroin. Um, it's more useful to get rid of the device that you use to access that. Now, I know for some people that might not be feasible because you, you have to have it for work or, or, or something. There are... Um, I don't know if you guys have heard like of the things like Covenant Eyes. Oh, yeah. uh, there, there are programs that you can like uh, like digital accountability kind of mm -hmm. programs that you can sign up for that will actually monitor your um, 
your internet usage yeah. and, and, we'll, and will we'll, not allow you to access that kind of material. That's called Covenant Eyes. Yeah. If you want to check that out, I've yeah. directed some people toward that before. Yeah, Keith, there are several um, of those. In fact, it's either Covenant Eyes or Guardian One will actually notify via text mm -hmm. or email your accountability team uh, oh, okay. when you access those certain it's things. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that's one of those things. You talk about like, having accountability, mm -hmm. um, that's just another layer of it. So. Yes, absolutely. And every amen to everything you said about yeah. accountability. Right. Um, find, find someone that you trust uh, that, uh, that, that'll, that'll help you. Um, now, that's what, that's what the church is, right? We're Galatians 6, bear one another's burdens. Uh, and in the context of that, it's the burdens of those who are caught in any transgression. Um, so we as the church of Christ are supposed to bear with the failings of the weak brethren who are caught in transgression. Um, and that includes things like pornography. Um, so um, find someone in the church, and you as the church, uh, be someone that you can, uh, if someone approaches you with this, be someone that is not going to judge this person or condemn this person, but has a heart to help this person, because that's what we are all commanded biblically to do. Uh, so I think that helpful. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, the last question is for uh, all three of the panelists. What is your favorite Bible verse and why? And uh, Brother Nathan, will start with you and go down the line. Awesome. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Um, I, I almost put just seven if it makes everybody. If, if you feel like highlighting in your Bible, I would highly recommend that you highlight in your Bible. Uh, if you still have that, what I call that inkling of religion on you that won't allow you to write in your Bible, then like print it off and like tape it on the inside or something. Uh, but 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 through 9 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, uh, but one of power, love, and sound judgment. So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or me, his prisoner. Instead, share in the suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Um, that is one of my favorite verses uh, in all the Bible, um, just because I think it's such an important reminder for all of us as Christians as we seek to live out the gospel, um, that we don't have to be uh, afraid because we're not given a spirit of fear, um, that God has, has called us to his calling. Now, as, as I got older uh, and, and studied it more, like I've always loved that verse. As I've got older and I've studied it more, and you place it in the context of, of Paul writing to what I'll call a, a quote-unquote newbie minister, uh, and this, this kind of young up-and-comer in, in, in Timothy, uh, and you know now myself being in ministry, it just makes it that much more uh, uh, adored, I guess, by me uh, personally. Um, and, and the context of everything that Paul's going to say to Timothy, uh, and everything that's going to follow this about how there are going to be persecutions and people aren't going to want to listen to you, and uh, you know you've got to stay true to the faith, and, and all these other things. The fact that he starts out with, uh, you know, look, God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you one of power uh, and of love and of sound judgment. And so there's nothing that you do or say that you need to be ashamed of, even if uh, things are going to be hard. And so I just begin, even as a minister, that, that impacts me a little bit more. But I think for Christians as a whole, uh, that that really should speak to volumes to us in the sense of uh, what our, our goal is and, and why we don't have to be ashamed or afraid of, of living up to it. Okay. So I have two that are kind of equal. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4 was the first verse I learned to recite in Hebrew. It's called the Shema. It's, you all know it. it's Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's a reminder of who God is and who we are, and that's why I love it so much. And then Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Uh, that's a prayer that I pray daily. because uh, I, I definitely, and I think we can all say, we all need that renewal of spirit. Okay. Um. I almost feel bad when people ask me this question because every time I ask, I have a different answer. Because <laughs> I just, <laughs> I have so many favorite scriptures. How yeah. can you just pick one? Uh, my favorite scripture right now, next time you ask me, it might be different. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Uh, it says this, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Out of all of the things that we go through um, in, in life, it, all, all of the, the temptations, the heartaches, the sorrows, the pains, um, everything that encompasses living in a sin-filled, uh, fallen world, there's not one person in this world, uh, in our present world, that knows exactly how you feel in the midst of all of it, except one. And that one is Jesus Christ. He has, as the text says, um, been tempted as we are and is um, able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he has become like us, because he has become our human brother, um, because he has embraced, he fully, he's fully God and he is fully human at the same time. Uh, so that just gives me so much encouragement and comfort and hope uh, as, as, I'm, as I'm tempted by uh, Satan and, and as we live in this ugly, sin-filled world with all kinds of horrendous realities um, and, and experience these on, on a daily basis. Uh, God knows exactly how I feel in the midst of all of it. Um, and the implication is he offers me mercy and grace and assistance and active help through all of it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I certainly appreciate uh, Brother Nathan and Brother Keith, especially for taking, a, uh, taking you away from your congregations tonight and being with us. Uh, I want to thank Brother Joshua for uh, inviting uh, uh, our two uh, other panelists and I uh, certainly appreciate again uh, uh, our young people for the questions that they uh, came up with uh, for our panel discussion tonight. And uh, at this time, uh, Brother Joshua is going to uh, extend the invitation.